Hello Slashaholics, be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, the 80 Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well, as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Don't forget to visit the 80 Slasher Librarian merch store. Lots of items, lots of designs. You pick the color and size. And be sure to use promo code TINOFF for 10% off your purchase. Link in the description below. Enjoy tonight's narration. A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 The Dream Master The Novelization by Joseph Locke Part 2 Alice Chapter 7 Three days later, when Alice got home from the funeral, she went into the family room and fished through the row of videotapes in the cabinet until she found the one she wanted. She slipped it into the VCR, turned on the television, and watched as Kristen appeared on the screen, laughing as Rick held her down on a patch of grass and tickled her. Stop it! Stop! Kristen shrieked. The images and voices that followed, Kristen and Rick playing, Debbie razzing Sheila about studying so much, Sheila razzing Debbie about working out so much, made Alice feel better. Returning from the funeral, she'd been overwhelmed by a need to see Kristen, hear her, be close to her. Alice heard Rick come into the family room, but did not look up. She couldn't take her eyes from the screen, as if she were drawn to Kristen's image. Alice, Rick whispered, sitting beside her on the sofa. What are you doing? I don't know, she shrugged. I guess it, it makes me feel better. She smiled at the screen. You made her so happy then, Rick, remember? Yeah. <sighs> he sighed heavily. Why didn't I stay with her that night? It wouldn't have made a difference. Sure it would have. Alice faced him. No, it wouldn't have. I saw it happen in my dream, Rick. There was this man, this horrible man, and... Oh, who? Freddy? He held up his hand. Look, I've had enough of Freddy, okay? I heard it all from Kristen, and I don't want to hear any more. So just stop it. He turned away from her. Alice didn't stop. She grabbed his shoulder and pulled him back around, saying urgently... I could smell the smoke, Rick. I could feel the heat from the fire. I watched her burn. He covered his face with his hands and growled. Mm, stop it! Just stop! Kristen wasn't crazy, and neither are you. Alice, you're not crazy, so why are you acting this way? Pulling his hands away, Alice saw that he was about to cry. Why, Alice... He whispered, I, I don't know, Rick, really, I, I just feel so, she tried to choose her words carefully. He was already beginning to think she might be losing it, and she didn't want that. She needed his help. I feel so different. Something happened in the dream, I think. I, I can't think of anything but Kristen, which is normal, I guess, but this is different. I changed in my dream. She did something to me. Now it's like part of her is with me all the time, inside me. I think I even look different, don't I? Don't you think so? He looked at her silently, shaking his head. Rick? He got up and left the room.
The next day, studying her reflection in the girl's restroom mirror, Alice was certain she had changed. Her face was more defined. Perhaps her features seemed to stand out more and her eyes seemed brighter, in spite of the fact that she'd been up all night and felt tired enough to sleep standing up. Someone had left a pack of Marlboros by the sink, and Alice shook one out, took matches from her purse, and lit it up, taking a puff. She burst into a fit of coughs and stared at the burning cigarette, sputtering. I, I don't smoke. But Kristen did, she thought, dropping the cigarette in the sink. Kristen, she whispered, what did you do to me? Sheila came in and stood at the faucet beside Alice and splashed cold water on her face. I'm dead on my feet, she said exhaustedly as she dried off with the paper towel. We have matching luggage, Alice said, startling herself. Those were Kristen's words. What? You've been up all night? That's obvious, huh? Alice brightened with hope. Then you saw him too? Saw who? I didn't see anybody. I was up all night cramming for this physics test, and I was putting this little baby together. She opened her book bag and removed a gadget that looked like an electric shaver with a joy buzzer on the end. You know how Debbie's afraid of bugs? Well, I made this for her. Ultra-high sound waves. Makes them run, screaming their antenna off. She frowned at Alice and asked, Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. She knew she didn't sound too convincing. Well, good luck on the test, Sheila said, gathering her things. See you in class. Once the physics test had begun, Mrs. Geary's classroom became silent as a tomb. It was the kind of silence that invited sleep, and Alice's vision blurred with exhaustion. Sheila was seated in front of her and already busy writing answers. Alice's eyes grew heavy, and her head bowed as she began to doze, the room's silence and warmth easing her into a comfortable sleep, until Sheila gasped and Alice snapped alert, leaning forward in her desk to see what was wrong. Sheila was sitting stiffly, staring at her test paper with her pen poised to write, as the pre-printed equations danced over the page like tiny acrobats, tumbling over one another, spinning and twirling. The numbers stopped, and letters were quickly scrawled on the paper with an invisible pen. Learning is fun with Freddy! I'm asleep, Alice thought. I gotta wake up. Wake up. I gotta... Alice heard something dripping and looked over Sheila's shoulder, again to see that blood was dripping from the point of Sheila's pen and splattering onto the paper. Skulls out! A familiar voice growled. Alice looked to the front and saw Freddy seated at Mrs. Geary's desk, peeling an apple with one of the blades on his right hand. He grinned at Sheila, tossed the apple aside, and stood. No! Alice cried, turning to get out of her seat, but a rusty metal bar slammed into place across her lap, trapping her behind the small desk as Freddy walked toward Sheila. No! Help! Somebody help! Alice looked around, but the other students were obliviously involved in their test. Freddy stood before Sheila, who was trembling like a kitten, and said, All work and no play make Sheila! A very dull girl! He leaned forward, plucked her glasses off, and flicked his tongue inches from her mouth, and then asked her, Wanna suck face? Sheila screamed as Freddy grabbed her collar, pulled her out of her seat, and pressed his mouth over hers, silencing her cries. Alice shouted frantically for help, but got no response, while Freddy's scarred cheeks pulled inward as he began to suck, and Sheila's eyes widened impossibly and bulged from their sockets, threatening to pop out as veins began to stand out on her forehead and neck, and her face and hands began to shrivel in her struggle to weaken as her skull seemed to deflate with the soft, moist sound, and her ribcage pressed hard against her shirt, imploded with the horrible crack. Somebody, please, help! Alice said, but quietly this time because she knew Sheila was lost. The girl's bulbous eyes dropped out of their sockets and dangled by bloody cords as her skin shriveled to a leathery husk, and Freddy slammed her down into her desk and laughed. You flock! Hey, Alice! She was right! 
she was dead on her feet. And now, she's dead in her seat. Then he turned to Alice, reached out and stroked her cheek carefully with one of his blades as he whispered, almost lovingly, Thank you. And Freddy was suddenly gone and the classroom was alive with panic as Sheila lay across the top of her desk, clutching her breast and gasping desperately for air. Quickly, Alice got up, fumbled the inhaler from Sheila's book bag and tried to force it into Sheila's writhing mouth. But Sheila's gasps stopped, her head dropped to the side, and her body became limp in the desk. The room was silent. Alice stood straight and looked around at the shocked students. Call an ambulance, somebody said, as Debbie, Dan, and Rick gathered around Alice. Alice spotted the bug-killing device Sheila had made for Debbie. It had fallen out of Sheila's book bag. She bent down and picked it up. Didn't you see him? Alice asked tremulously. He was here. He did this. I saw him. Rick took her arm and gently coaxed her out of the room as Alice rambled on and on. He did this. I watched it. I, I, I saw it. After all the students had been dismissed for the day, Rick, Alice, Debbie, and Dan stood in front of the school as the ambulance drove slowly out of the parking lot, carrying Sheila's corpse. Rick tried unsuccessfully to calm Alice, but he no longer snapped at her like before. Instead, he found himself trying to ignore her talk about Freddy. It was no longer annoying. It was downright scary. Asthma attack my ass, Debbie mumbled, fighting tears. What? What, come on, what 17-year-old has a fatal asthma attack? I told you, Alice insisted, it was Freddy. Enough of that crap, Debbie snapped. I saw it, I told you, it was my dream, I, I, I brought Sheila in. She turned to Rick slowly, her face darkening with the horrible realization. Oh God, I brought her into my dream, like Kristen did with me. I gave her to Freddy, and now she's dead, she hissed, backing away. Sobbing, she turned and ran away from them. Rick's insides ached as he heard his sister cry. Rick, Dan said, I think Kristen's story is getting to your sister. In a flash of anger, Rick barked, Look, Dan, I'm not so sure it's a story anymore, okay? You mean, you believe it? Well, look at us. We're dropping like flies around here. Rick looked at Debbie and could see in her eyes the same fear he felt. Then he turned and ran after Alice. That night, Alice sat down at her vanity and took from the mirror a picture of herself and Sheila, both laughing and happy. Looking up at the mirror, she saw that still more of her reflection had been exposed by removing the picture. She touched her face in disbelief. She looked prettier, stronger. Chapter 8 A few nights after Sheila's funeral, Dan entered the Craven Inn and saw Alice behind the register. He'd come to pick up his call-in order to take the drive-in. Brenda McCarsky, captain of the cheerleader team, was waiting for him in his pickup. She could wait. Hey, um, so Alice, how you doing? He asked, and she smiled wearily. Haven't uh, seen you around lately. I've been working double shifts. Extra money, huh? You know why, Dan. You just don't believe me. No offense, Alice, really. It's just kind of hard to swallow. The story is, but you can't argue with four deaths. Tears welled up in her eyes. I don't know what to do. I can't stop it. Why doesn't he just kill me? On impulse, Dan reached over the counter and took her hand. How long have you been awake? Three days. In spite of the fact, she looked well-rested and strong. Very pretty, in fact. 
not as plain as before. Something about her was different. Don't you understand? She whispered. Every time I sleep, someone might die. All right, Alice. Let's assume this whole thing is true. Why is Freddy all of a sudden after you? She chewed her lower lip for a moment and then said, Kristen was the last child left of the people who killed Freddy. Maybe Freddy can't get to new kids without someone like me, someone to bring them to him, like me. The bell over the door clanged and Brenda stuck her head in and called. Danny, we're going to be late for the drive-in. He rolled his eyes. Be right there. Alice got his order for him and, as he paid, Dan said, Look, if there's anything I can do... Thanks, she said, smiling. Dan suddenly lost interest in his date with Brenda McCarsky, but he turned and left anyway. The next day, as everyone else suited up for practice in the locker room, Rick went to a stall, locked the door, and sat on the toilet. He needed to be alone for a moment. The deaths had created a lot of tension. Just moments before, Dan had nearly beaten up Buddy Milton for saying Alice was a basket case. But Rick had the added pressure of staying up every night with Alice. He didn't know how she managed to do it. He was ready to collapse. He put his head in his hands, elbows on his knees, and relaxed. Well, tried to relax. Just for a minute or two, he thought. But two minutes became five and ten. And Rick began to doze as... Alice struggled to stay awake in Miss Kapitsky's history class. The aging woman lectured in her dry, monotone voice, and Alice's head dropped forward heavily. Her eyes closed as she rested her head on her desktop. Just for a little while, she thought. But when she was jarred from her rest, Alice realized she was in a darkened locker room facing a row of stalls. Half a dozen uniformed cheerleaders hurried into the room waving their pom-poms and giggling. But Alice was certain it wasn't the girl's locker room. The cheerleaders went to the stall on the end and opened the door, crowding inside. Moving forward, Alice peered into the stall and saw Rick sitting on the toilet with a startled look on his face. She was relieved to see him and pushed her way into the crowded stall. Rick, she said. What's happening, Rick? Why are we... The stall door slammed shut and the entire stall rumbled and jerked like, a, like, an, like an elevator. Soft, syrupy music began to play from overhead, an elevator music version of taps. They were in an elevator. The giggling cheerleaders seemed not to notice. They lavished Rick with kisses, fondling and stroking him until the elevator jerked to a halt, and the door slid open. Alice moved toward Rick, but the cheerleaders headed out of the elevator, pushing her back with them. No! She shouted, fighting them unsuccessfully. No! Rick! Rick! Once she was outside the elevator, the door slid shut with an ominous rumble, and she threw herself onto it, prying at it with her fingers, heaving and pulling, until the door slid open, and Rick smiled at her, stepped toward her. But the floor trembled and cracked and collapsed beneath him its pieces falling silently down a black bottomless shaft as Rick grabbed the railing on the wall and dangled over the pit, his legs kicking as he made small panicky sounds in his throat. Rick! Alice screamed, reaching for him. Going down! A voice said from above, and Kristen looked up to see Freddy grinning at them through the elevator's gridless vent. Chainsaws, lingerie, butcher knives... And infinity! <laughs> Freddy threw back his head and laughed uproariously as the railing began to glow a soft red and Rick's hands began to smoke. As the railing grew rapidly hotter, Rick's palms sizzled and gave off a sickly smell and he screamed, Alice! Help me! Help me, please, God! Alice! Alice, help me! His hands let go and he disappeared into the blackness, his voice fading with him. Alice screamed and looked up at Freddy, who waved to her with his knives. Thank you, he whispered again, as Alice awoke at her desk with a jolt, startling her classmates and Miss Kapitsky. When she realized what had just happened, 
Alice pounded the desk with her fist and screamed, No! She dashed from the room, ran down the hall and across campus to the gymnasium, then into the boys' locker room. Coach Williamson ran toward her, shouting, Hey, young lady, what, what do you think you're... She dodged, ran around him, and found the stalls, opening the one on the end. Rick lay limp, sprawled face down over the toilet. Alice dropped to her knees and released a long, ragged, agonizing scream. Chapter 9 Squinting in the glare of the sun, Alice stared at her brother's casket. As the minister droned monotonously, a large crowd was gathered around the gravesite, mostly teenagers. Sniffles and an occasional sob broke the cemetery stillness. Alice felt a disturbing numbness. She saw no end to the deaths, and her mind seemed to be blocking off any more tears or pain. She stared at the casket, stared and stared and and... The lid swung open and Rick sat up smiling. This is great, huh? He laughed. They think I'm dead. I love it. He got out of the casket and walked over to her, touching her cheek. Hey, you know I wouldn't leave you all alone, Alice. This was just a full old Freddy. A tear in her eye, Alice shook her head and whispered, No, no more daydreams. What are we going to do, Alice? Debbie's voice startled her from the daydream. The minister had finished and the crowd was breaking up. It seemed odd to see Debbie crying. She was so tough. We're going to stop daydreaming, Alice said, and take that son of a bitch out. What? God, Alice, what are you talking about? I'm sick of this shit. Who's next, huh? Can you tell me that? Alice took her arm and led her away from the open grave. Dan followed them. You'll be next if you don't get a grip on yourself, understand? You're going to have to do more than bench presses this time. We have to get smart, smarter than Freddy. We're going to get him. Debbie seemed to calm down. She even seemed to be taking Alice seriously. Let me help, Dan said. I'm not saying I don't believe you, but, well, well, maybe, maybe we should get help from someone else. Oh, sure, Debbie snapped. Let's trade death by Freddy for life in a rubber room. She's right, Alice agreed. Other people, especially adults, won't see it. Well, it couldn't hurt, Dan tried again. Debbie then said, Look, it would be a waste of time. We should start thinking about how we're going to kick Freddy's ass. That's right, Alice examined. And remember, mind over matter. Alice heard her father calling for her and backed away from her friends. Look, I'll see you guys later, okay? She headed across the cemetery toward her father. He was already drunk. Dan watched her go. Mind over matter, Debbie said quietly. Sheila said that to me once. I don't get it. Every day it's like Alice is someone different. No, Dan whispered. It's after every death. Do you really want to tell someone, Dan? About Freddy, I mean? Yeah. And I know just the guy. The next day, Dan and Debbie went to see Mr. Bryson, their English literature teacher. Dan knew that Bryson taught a college night class in mythology and had a background in philosophy. Even better, he was a veteran of the 60s, and as Dan and Debbie stood in Bryson's office, Dan noticed a couple of Woodstock posters on the wall. They'd been talking with him for about ten minutes, asking questions about dreams, and now Bryson sat at his desk, stroking his chin thoughtfully. Eh, uh, well, Bryson said, every society dating back to the ancients has had theories regarding dreams, what they mean, how to control them. Control them? Yes. Aristotle believed that during sleep your soul roams free. What it sees are dreams. Skilled dreamers control what they see. Where do the souls go? There's supposed to be two gates your soul can enter. One on a positive dream gate, the other a negative. The dream master guards the positive gate, protects its sleeping host. Is there a guard for the negative gate? Debbie asked. 
There were never any theories about that. Dan hesitated a moment and then said, What if we told you about a guy, a demon who lived in dreams and could kill you in your sleep? Bryson raised his eyebrows curiously. Ah, yup, sounds a bit radical, but yes, it could fit the theory. Great, Dan said enthusiastically, because it's true. There is a guy. His name's Freddy, Debbie added. Bryson looked at them suspiciously. Freddy. Yeah, Dan said, becoming animated. He lives in your dreams and kills you. Now, how do we stop it? Bryson stood, holding up his hands. Whoa, whoa, now slow down, wait a minute. Hey, Aristotle was writing fiction, okay? I mean, none of this is real. Debbie glared at him, getting angry. So what are you saying, that we're full of it? No, not at all, just, well, there have been a lot of deaths around here lately, and I know how stress can get to you children. Tell you what, he removed a business card from his pocket and offered it to Debbie. This is a guy who raps to young people, really understands them. Why don't you give him a try? Debbie slapped the card out of Bryson's hand and spat. Save it. Save all your bullshit. She turned to Dan. Alice was right. Let's go. Bryson followed them into the hall, calling. No, wait. You should see this guy. Tell him about Freddy. And remember, you guys just say no. Alice was waiting for them at the foot of the hall stairs. Satisfied? She asked. I knew it would be a waste of time. Debbie grumbled. Dan was disappointed. He shook his head and said, I don't get it. He's from the 60s. I thought those people believed anything. Look, Alice said, we have to keep thinking. Use our heads and stay sharp. Starting tonight, we sleep in shifts. Sooner or later, we're going to conk out, Dan warned. No, we're not, Alice snapped. We're going to get ready. We're going to get ready for Freddy. Debbie unclasped a wicked blank leather bracelet with silver studs from her wrist and handed it to Alice. A bad luck charm, she smirked, brings bad luck to the creep you flatten with it. Alice smiled gracefully and then turned to Dan. He felt like a failure. He'd been so sure Bryson would help. But when Alice took his hand, he knew it didn't matter. They would help each other. That night, Alice got Rick's nunchucks and Oriental-style bandana from the garage and took them to her room, where she hung the bandana beside the mirror above Sheila's bug-killing gadget. She put Debbie's studded bracelet on the vanity table, then spotted the picture of herself and Rick on the mirror. She pulled it off the glass, studied it a moment, and then looked at her reflection in the mirror. She could see more of herself, and she had changed even more. She thought she was quite attractive now, there was a new surety and strength in her eyes. Alice took the nunchucks to the middle of the room and tried some of the moves she'd seen Rick go through in the garage. She was slow and clumsy at first, but in mere minutes her arms began to move rapidly, and the nunchucks sliced the air with a whining hum, whipping around her, slapping from one hand to another, the chain clinking and clicking. She stopped suddenly, realizing that what she'd just done was better than anything she'd ever seen Rick do, and he practiced. Alice turned to her reflection again and whispered, What's happening to me? Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 7, 8, and 9 of A Nightmare on Elm Street for The Dream Master, the novelization by Joseph Locke. Gotta touch on something really quick. I'm really happy that we got Rick's death from the original script. Uh, they weren't able to shoot that in the movie, so they ended up doing the invisible Freddy karate scene. Uh, so yeah, really digging the fact uh, that we got that extra death scene with Rick that we didn't get in the movie. Played out really cool. I don't know, the whole toilet thing turning into an elevator, it was a bit confusing, but it was really good imagery. Uh, Joseph Locke really puts you in the nightmare there. Yeah, it's not my favorite nightmare that Freddy's ever killed somebody in, but it's better than Invisible Karate Freddy 
Rock'em Sock'em Invisible Robots, or whatever the hell that was supposed to be in the movie. Um, also, we got a couple extra lines from Freddy whenever he killed uh, Sheila. And uh, I realized tonight that in chapters uh, 5 and 6, I messed up and I accidentally did Sheila's voice for Debbie and Debbie's voice for Sheila in the, the first time we see everybody in the Craven Inn. Um, so, I went back and fixed that. I'm going to go ahead and leave the upload up, but whenever I do the unabridged version, it will have the correct voices for uh, those characters uh, in that chapter. Um, yeah, mistakes happen. I'm not perfect, obviously, and I knew it was bound to happen sometime or another, but the upload's been up for you know a few days now. It's all over social media. People have shared the link, so I don't want to delete it, um, but I will fix it in the unabridged version. Uh, so if that confused anybody or you were like, what the hell is he doing? Uh, in the last upload, I do apologize for that. Uh, but yeah, all in all, I thought these chapters were pretty good. He's kind of rushing the story, which I understand because, you know, this book is split between part four and part five. But hey, the first book, you know, the Nightmares on Elm Street book split up parts one, two, and three in one book. So at least we're going to get a little, you know, a little bit longer uh, for Dream Master and Dream Child out of this book, hopefully. Uh, there are a bunch of pictures, uh, pages of pictures in here, too. I might throw those in uh, to the unabridged version. Um, but yeah, so, you know, tonight we got Sheila's death, and we got Rick's death, and we got the rest of them, you know, prepping for their fight with Freddy. Um, <laughs> sorry, I kind of gave uh, the teacher, Bryson, kind of like a Maine, New England type voice or something, something I was toying with. Um, just just to see what I could do with it. But yeah, I love how he thinks they're just on drugs. You know, it's like, go see that guy about Freddy and be sure to say no. Um, just say no. Which uh, I wish somebody would have told that to the guy that wrote Jason X Death Moon. Um, yeah, listen to that audiobook sometime and tell me there weren't some drugs involved. <laughs> Alright guys, so yeah, two more down in tonight's narration. We got the extra dream that we didn't get in the movie. Uh, the, the real death of Rick, the way it was supposed to be in the movie. Um, kind of glad I didn't have to narrate an invisible fight scene. Uh, that was That's always, even as a kid, I was like, what? what? Why is Freddy invisible? You know, there's no, there's no context there. But hey, easy day for, for Robert England, just step into the voiceover booth. Um, Sheila's death has always been pretty cool. Um, it would have been cool if Freddy turned to, you know, Alice and said, Suck it! Or something afterwards, but, uh, you know, You want to suck face? You're flunked! And, uh, She was dead on her feet, and now, She's dead in her seat! So, uh, it was kind of cool having Teacher Freddy up there peeling the apple. Let me know what you guys thought of these chapters tonight. Um, did I miss any differences from the movie? For some reason, I feel like part of uh, Rick coming out of the casket in her daydream at the funeral played out a little bit differently than the movie, like it, like a, a line was different. Can somebody let me know if that's if that's what I'm missing here? Was there any other differences uh, in tonight's uh, narration compared to the movie other than the ones I've already listed? Um, I'd love to hear it if I missed anything. And uh, I'll be back very soon with more of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street for the Dream Master. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and pleasant dreams! Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's Tony DeVore, Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velcarve, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree, Bonanza, Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Saib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, Simonoli, and Carl Eakins. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel on Patreon. I couldn't do this without you. The channel would not exist without you. So a million times thank you.